I'll share my screen as previously committed. There we go. All right, we're recording. Thanks, Sean, for sharing the notes. Welcome to another uh, Chaos OSPO Metrics Working Group. Uh, I am Gary. I will be hosting this instance of this group. Uh, there's not a lot of people here. We are going to get through some of this, but uh, unfortunately, the very first line item that I put is the reason why a lot of people may not be here. Uh, OSPOs for good in New York City, it's happening. I assume that's where everybody is. Uh, and then other people have various other engagements. So we'll ask this again next week. How did it go? How are things? Did anybody see anything exciting? Uh, and then maybe this next item we can chat about a little bit, uh, or it would be better when we have a few more folks from a few more places uh, around. But uh, hi, Don. Um, when working with vendors, uh, what kind of scrutiny does your OSPO put on code, uh, code coming in and being worked on when it comes from a vendor? Because I know we have various levels of this that's not super handled by an OSPO, but I'm curious if this is like a function that I don't know about that some OSPOs do, uh, scanning the code that comes in and seeing what kind of open source is in it. I can share a couple of anecdotes, but I haven't got any experience myself. All right. Hi, Don. Hi, Hi Don. Hey, everybody. I thought you were somewhere else. I, I was. I just walked in the door. I was, in London all, I was in London all day today, and then my train was late. OK. A lot of folks probably at OSPOs for good is what we're thinking. I mm -hmm. think so. Yeah. Go ahead, Sean. You said you had a few exciting anecdotes. Yeah, um, at the Espology meeting in Stockholm, this was discussed quite a lot. And the context was uh, what accountability will OSPOs have for AI assets brought in? Because when people use AI, is that software? Is that under the OSPO? Or is it not? Is it under the security organization? And there is quite a bit of ambiguity about where that belongs. But it did raise this other question about how does the OSPO assess incoming technology assets, software, or in the case of this discussion, AI. And there, there did not seem to be a consensus or any consistency across OSPOs uh, regarding how that did or did not happen. The other anecdote I have is um, I've worked with a couple of organizations that scanned all of the repos that they use, and they used that to understand where they had the most where they had dependency concentrations, I guess I would say. So if you have 11,000 projects, um, they would look across all of those and then add up the number of projects that use particular dependencies and basically rank those dependencies. Um, it's not the scanning activity that you're discussing, but you could use the same approach to, a, to understand what you're bringing in house in addition to the project, like what are the dependencies, what are the other things that are included that may or may not be problematic. Well, that's my lack of experience, but many conversations. All right. Those are some good anecdotes, at least. Very interesting ways to approach it, because yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. I'm just kind of posing the question to anybody. And Gerard, uh, sorry, I want to get your name right. Gerardo, uh, feel free to chime in here if you have something to share. Uh, when working with vendors, what kind of scrutiny uh, does OSPO put on code coming in uh, or after it's being worked on when it comes from a vendor? Because I'm dealing with this right now uh, at uh, Verizon where we're trying to think of a strategy on how we're going to do this. And I was curious if any other OSPOs had experience doing this or approaches that they think are better than others. And uh, this gives me some things to chew on and think about. So a long, a long time ago, um, we had done a project with a large company here in Omaha on doing um, scans on check-in. And so, Sean, it's actually, you know, the, the do socks module that you have? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That was, that was what that was actually built for. So. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, developers would do a check-in and it would trigger that 
to essentially produce kind of an income inbound check on uh, like licensing kind of things. And so we had a process internal to this organization that would do those checks. And so I always understood that DUSAX module to be mostly about licensing, or that's the only thing I use it for. But it that like was it. it. Yeah, that was really, that was it at the time. It was built off of the SPDX 2.0 spec. Yep. And so just to kind of produce that, so because right now or like back in the day, they were checking in software with no check of anything, like Zippo. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so they were like, how can we at least begin our compliance process? during that check-in process. So anyway, that's what that was. So we, I've actually done something here with a company around this, but it was, it was for like, it wasn't specifically focused on vendors, Gary. No, yeah, yeah. Anything that, but I mean, in theory, you could take that vendor code and <laughs> just, you know. Yeah, kind of run the same thing, right? Because yep. and I know there's also this angle of how S-bombs are playing into this when Sometimes vendors will provide an S bomb, but then is that categorized anywhere? Does it even go through open source scrutiny, or is it just kind of like a boilerplate that gets reported at the end of the day? What kind of things are you looking for? Uh, well, obviously, well, I say obviously, but as the OSPO, we care about um, licensing and security and viability, and trying to create a cohesive data set or system that registers everything in all of the components in all of the applications is fat uh, it's it's multifaceted where you have to consider different paths for vendors because vendors don't have access to the internal systems that we would otherwise be drawing data from and then the internal systems that we draw data from you have to build the relationship with the team and say pretty please give us the data and then you have to aggregate it and normalize it and figure out what you care about and put it in the right data format right and so I was like, it seems like a, a pretty logical extension to just figure out the new data source and then ingest it in that way that we then produce these numbers of uh, what the viability looks like and what the security and licensing looks like. But it's always, I you know, the kind of topic that's worth bringing to the table while we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. No worries, Damien. All right. Uh, with that, I think unless anybody else has things they want to contribute, we can move on. Curious to... about Maven Central on it. Looks like that's been hacked or something. Yeah. So Maven Central um, wasn't hacked, but they put out a blog post, which is linked right there, of how they noticed that 83% of the traffic was coming from just 1% of IP addresses. And in Does case. This... Is this 1% of the set of IP addresses going to Maven Central? Yes. All, okay. Yeah. So they were seeing that uh, out of the folks that make use of Maven Central to download Java dependencies, 83% uh, of the traffic out was going to just 1% of the IP addresses that was consuming it, which, you know, that's a tragedy of the commons problem. I think that's what they called the article uh, because then Unfortunately, they can't sustain that forever. And um, it feel, the way that um, this blog post represents the problem is that Maven Central is supposed to be the first line of where you get dependencies as a large company or as a large institution. Or if you're a small company or a small institution, then just use Maven Central. But otherwise, they would expect that there's some caching layer uh, in between Maven Central and where your code is deployed or built. And it seems like a lot of uh, large users weren't doing this, this important step to not just reduce load against Maven Central, like a public resource, but also for stability in their builds and integrity and ability to audit what is actually coming in and going into their code. So they're planning to rate limit after a while uh, these very large users so that they don't affect most of the population, but the very, very large users have to implement another strategy for the long-term uh, serviceability of the platform. And Sean, before I say what I was going to say next, just have your hand up. No, you can say what you finish, finish your thoughts, Gary. Oh, okay. Uh, last thing that I was going to mention is just 
like for for me in my career path i've always been comfortable talking about build infrastructure working with build infrastructure people and trying to integrate that into ospo um but i wanted to like ask the crowd uh in this call like how much does your ospo get involved with build infrastructure is this something that anybody in this group is building ideas and structures around this idea that this caching layer is actually quite important and are there any controls in place or things that ospo does specific to that layer i have a, I have a comment so it's been 19 years since i used uh, worked on a java project so it's been a minute but uh, no i work with python more and go and both of those languages, uh, distribution libraries, cache things locally on a machine without me having to think about it or do anything. And and this seems like maybe Maven doesn't have that architecture and they're expecting people to take an extra step to do that. Uh, Maven does have that. So okay. you have like a local Maven cache per machine. Okay. But I so assume, so... yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I assume, I mean, nobody really knows, right? But this is this is what Maven is seeing from their side, that if you build a container and you deploy a container that downloads Maven dependencies every time that it starts, that would create quite a bit of load as containers scale up and scale down and start and stop and services start and stop. And there's no like requirement when you're downloading or when you're starting a container on AWS or GCP or whatever that you don't like have those dependencies packaged within the container. It's poor practice, but it's not something that's explicitly not allowed. And so I think the assumption by the Maven team here is that, uh, first of all, cache your dependencies locally. And second of all, if you're a very large company that is scaling up and down thousands and thousands of instances every day, then don't download all of your dependencies straight from Maven Central every time. So there's multiple ways to solve this for sure, that you have better builds that are actually like, you know, solidified within a, a, a VM image or a container that all the dependencies are included. You can have caching locally within your company that there's like a secondary cache proxy kind of thing, where for example, like you might use Artifactory and Artifactory has like a pass-through cache that allows you to pull a dependency from Maven and it's cached in Artifactory. So the next time anybody else in the company asks for it through Artifactory, it would like come directly from that cache. There's solutions to this and they're they're pushing the problem that it is so bad that 83% that of their traffic comes from just 1% of the, the folks who use Maven Central. And by not having rate limiting or any process in place, they're just encouraging that sort of bad behavior, right. right? It's not like people can't cash some of that stuff. It's just that they don't care because there's no penalty for not doing. What well, what I saw about this, not in my in my current shop, but before, is that usually the people doing that proxy, that caching, is upsec. So you you get infosec to do that cache because it's important that they can just roll back something that may even publish it uh, internally because lock for shake or something like that happens. Uh, they want to apply a patch or something in the middle. They take that responsibility. And OSPO, the interface on trying to be, they don't own it. They just interface with the AppSec team to provide some guidance on good practices on how to inject this proxy to everyone else in the company or stuff like that. But the usually the the way I see it is AppSec has the more bigger stake to handle this, but OSPO guides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems to be my experience as well. I uh, just think that it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting thing that's coming up. And like how much does OSPO get involved? And it sounds like helps drive guidance, but maybe doesn't get engaged directly with any build infrastructure. Sean, you still have your hand up. Do you have more? Oh, do I? Questions? I don't, I, it's unintentional. When I'm sharing my screen, I, it's a little bit. Oh hard. yeah. 
yeah, 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 it's hard. You can, right. close, you can close that down. I don't have, a, I don't intend it. I'll try to find it. That's all right. Yeah. Just another little goings on that I thought was worth mentioning in the open source world. Is there anything, any other comments, any other input on this topic? No, I mean, part of me wonders like, you know, all these companies are using other languages and building things in other languages. And it just feels like, I mean, Java has always been kind of a bloated architecture. And I just wonder if, uh, if there's a Java-ness to this problem, because surely it would exist for every other language. Uh, could be, it could be that there's a Java-ness to this problem. Um, it could be that this is the first signal that mm -hmm. other companies and other architectures may start expecting that you are better about this build practice. Yeah, you could, that uh, could be the case also. I'm surprised that Java is actually one that suffers most of this because you need to build to deploy. So mm -hmm. it, it's weird that, that Java is the one leading this thing, but I, I can see that PIP has this problem too, like uh, Homebrew has it worse uh, because it's very small a small provider and they serve everyone um but yeah i saw it in python i saw it in node node has the same issue where they throttle down people since long ago uh, mostly the the contributor is hit runners because hit runners is kind of hard to make the docker image and have everything inside maintaining it, they don't have an, uh, an automation for that. So people usually just make an image. They don't make any image, that's first. And if they make one image, the first line in the code is an update. And as soon the image start to get aging, it start consuming more and more and more packages in the update step. Mm -hmm. I know Docker did rate limiting at the same time that they did their enterprise licensing. So if you uh, purchase a personal or enterprise license, then the rate limiting doesn't apply to you. But if you're anonymously pulling or you're pulling from a non-paid account, they have a certain amount of like pulls that you can do per project per day. Um, so maybe maybe this isn't the first thing. Maybe it's just the first language or one of the first language things that has a similar problem that's trying to solve it so yeah, yeah it'd be interesting to see how if this pattern repeats itself across different package managers yeah and like who would own that problem would it would it be uh, as we're saying like application security takes kind of the brunt of the actual infrastructure and ospo does practices i don't know it feels like something adjacent at least yeah, I, I from what I'm hearing, I, I, I suspect it's all the containers being created and destroyed that are consuming a lot of this. I think you made that point, Gary. Yeah, I, I suspect so. Just it's very easy to say, oh, I'm just going to Maven install every time I start, right? Or maybe there's a Maven install and up at the same time kind of thing. That's what Eight Knots Docker container does. That's what Augur's Docker container does. We make no attempt to cache anything. Just right. It all every time we start the container. Right. And it's that's the, the easiest way to do it. I never learned there was a different way. I just assumed the whole purpose of Docker was to create something ephemeral from a yep. deployment perspective. Yeah, and it's it's different build, um, you know, sustainability problems. Yeah. Because if if Maven's down, then suddenly your container won't start. Or if it's not accessible because of network, then it suddenly won't start. Or if it gets rate limited, suddenly it won't start. No. That's how AppSec uh, and reliability get into the role first. <laughs> they, they start okay. noticing these problems, like availability will come and say something like, hey, we are missing this. And as soon as they bring it up, AppSec is going to be like, this is something I need to take custody of. Um, mm -hmm. So usually a problem comes from that side. But Mm -hmm. Keep updated for when the first outage of a big service happens because we find out that their build infrastructure did this. Uh, all right. 
Moving on, uh, Divya, who might not make it to the meeting, wanted to raise that our first Chatham House call for I ISO standardization of metrics and models was yesterday. Uh, the next call is on August 14th. And it seems like there's some discussions and outcomes here. Uh, was anybody yeah. at that call that can talk more about how it went? Yeah, actually a number of us were on that call here. Yeah. Yeah. You, did, you did a nice breakdown at the end. Yeah, it, um, it went really well. So we kind of have two paths that we're doing. So a couple of folks are going to work on a blog post. I think Damien had raised some issues on like why we even need to do this in the first place. And so there's a blog post that's, um, I think, Sean, you had taken a first pass on it. I, I sketched out some ideas. I haven't actually started writing the thing okay. yet. Okay. Um, and you can see that link there. And um, just kind of articulating why we need to even go down the path of ISO standardization in the first place. <laughs> What's the point? And so there was a really nice discussion on that and some really nice ideas captured. And then the second outcome is that we're going to start working. Divya and I had had a talk with some folks from the JDF at the Linux Foundation, kind of on the process by which we can um, start working towards an ISO standard on some of our metric models. And Divya and I are going to start that process um, with the JDF on one candidate metric model. And you can see, Gary, it is actually the compliance and security metric model. Yeah. So <laughs> this I, I I swear I did not write any viability things this meeting and it came up anyway. Yeah, it did. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's organic. It's just part of the it's in the air now. It, it it's it's pretty great because it's it, it feels good. I'm I'm glad I'm happy to see it picked as the first one. Is there any reason we picked compliance and security over Well over because those two topics are kind of front uh, and center for so many people then mm -hmm. It just, I think it's going to resonate with people, at least when we talked on the call, that it would resonate with people. Just that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and so there is going to be some. Um, no, yeah, so process. What's that? Um, I think somebody. I, I suppose someone. Hi. Yeah. Hey. 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 Um, I suppose someone from the ISO was in the meeting. Someone from what? From ISO. No, no one from ISO is there. Uh, Matt has been working with Divya on the uh, JDF, what's it called? The Joint Development Foundation. Yeah. And so they're the group at the LF that can help in this process. And so they, Seth and another person who we met had kind of talked us through the process by which we can work with the JDF and kind of the steps that need to be done. And so there's a whole series of things like we have to get the chaos project registered in a system with the JDF. I don't remember the name of that system. Um, we have to take the metric model that is here, the viability one, and get it into a format that's more suitable for ISO. We have, we're going to have to do a, um, like a, a tour where, where we go around and we talk about this model in its in its ISO form and collect feedback mm -hmm. from the community. So that's going to take a little while. Um, and then we can apply and then we'll have to incorporate feedback from the ISO reviewers. That's fine. I was just asking this because I've been involved in several open source standardization projects. Yeah. And one of the first discussions is the, the question of avoiding any contact with ISO because of their copyright practices, uh, stemming from the fact that, well, there is a known project that basically was hijacked of its own uh, standard. Yeah. See, I don't know. So, but my question was yeah. uh, about the negotiation about rights, because that's the thing. Once it's in ISO, uh, it's no longer an open, an open source thing because it has a table. Agreed. And so we had talked to to the folks at the JDF about that. I think the one advantage that we're going to have in that regard is we're not standardizing a process. We're standardizing just a definition of how to think about, in this case, compliance and security with respect to viability. So um, it, it's really just on that definitional standard and not a process 
by which that standard would be deployed. And I understand these are two different things in ISO. And I, from what I understand, the process one is the one that's more pro problematic that when you publish it as a standard, then people yes. Okay. But the, so all the whole negotiation handling of the standard with ISO is done by the JDF. That's correct. And I have to talk with you. Just to but but I, I appreciate this point, and it's something that we'll continue to to watch. I, I don't have a probably a clear answer for you right now. It's a, it's administrative thing, so it shouldn't really bother you while you're constructing the the standard. Okay. To make sure that everything is done right on. Gotcha. On the, um, the copyright side. Um, but okay, I'll, I'll I'll be sure to to check this. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is new territory for us. I can be honest. So any advice is is much appreciated. I've been also on the IEEE thing, so uh, and I'm still there. So. And that was a point of contention about the, the OSS governance uh, okay. project was there, especially precisely because it wasn't, it wouldn't uh, be an open source way of doing things. Um, so it now actually that project is on under the Eclipse Foundation, but it doesn't matter. I'll I'll be sure to be following this, and so now I have the direct link I already marked in my calendar the 14th of august so that Great. can follow up and Fantastic. see on, um, thank you yeah and uh matt feel free to pull me in or poke me or whatever you'd like for helping with the uh, publishing standard or i guess socializing publishing whatever um okay. mm -hmm. be happy to donate yeah, as much time or as little time as you like the dual license so that Yep. They still can do a lot of things and it still stays open. And then there are a few things, sorry to to disturb your, your line of thought, but um, after a few decisions on the European Court of Justice, if something is referred in the law, a standard is referred in the law, that standard has to become open or has to be open. So uh, it no longer can be uh, um, behind the paywall, like the ISO standards, IEEE standards, and all the others. Um, so but let's see how it goes. Don't, don't uh, that's a concern for, for the geeks uh, that follow law. Perfect. But, um, appreciate that. And Gary, I appreciate that too on the help to sure. circulate this when the time yeah comes. Uh, i'll be more adamant to uh attend those those sync ups i i missed that first one that's okay i think our intention is like we would get it into a format you know like this a, a format similar to what open chain uses mm. and then um like circulate it through like OSSNA, oss europe like just kind of running you know, yeah for, other session kind of thing just to say here it is let's talk about it. and the content shouldn't change from what you have here it's really just a format issue the the way that c++ handle this is they only make a standard a uh, previous draft that is approved without changes by unanimity and the draft is open <laughs> yes it's a way of working around the thing but Really. They've been doing it for 40 years, so it seems yes. to be le yep. legal. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way they handle it. They publish the draft always free, open, it's in GitHub, it's under a community commons, a creative commons license, I think. Uh, and they can only approve one that is a full draft. They never approve changes in the last draft. And they want to standardize it is always that one that was approved. Uh, for compliance, some companies go pay the to read the legal version. If you are not doing it for compliance reasons, just read the last draft is exactly the same. That makes sense. 
Um, John, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, Gary, are, do you have interest in the ISO part of this or just the use of the model that you generated? I'm only asking them trying to assemble a podcast. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I think I think the two are pretty linked uh, in that it, it being standardized beyond chaos is like something that I'm interested in being a part of because I, you know, publicized Excellent. it here and helped publish it. So. Sorry to use this for gathering information, but thirdly, thank you. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any other comments, thoughts, things to share on that meeting and hope to see you there next time. I really appreciate the feedback. Thanks everybody. This is the next one is me, the book chapter. Go ahead. Um, it's nothing more than an update. So this is a book chapter that is the, the to do group has been a book that the Anna at the to do group has been putting together and we have a book chapter coming out of kind of this group so you can click on it there we've talked about it for quite a while in this group um, about thinking about impact I brought it I just wanted to let people know I brought it to the university OSPO working group as well, because a lot of universities. Uh, are starting to build ospos themselves and so I thought you know just bringing putting it in front of them as a chapter that might be a useful resource not only for corporate ospos but for university ospos would be would be nice and so that's it that's the update awesome so i'm sorry just to be clear you're looking for contributions or just for readers no um if you want to take a look at it and provide like editorial feedback go ahead i think it's pretty much done i'm adding um a case at the end as to how a company could think about um, communicating impact in one of these four areas that i have in the book chapter so but i think i've got that covered so if you want to provide editorial feedback great if you want to provide structural feedback well <laughs> too late <laughs> i don't want it <laughs> awesome yeah Thanks for sharing. Thanks for that. And yep. awesome stuff. You've been sharing that for a long time. It's awesome to see it come together. Yeah, I think it's going to be done here in you know about a month or so. The OSPO book, it's happening. It is All right. happening. Be yeah. Before we get into any reminders, are there any ad hoc items folks are thinking about while we have everybody here? Going once, going twice, it's gone. We're moving on. Uh, reminders uh, for the researchers. Uh, it, it, does anybody, I, this was published last week. I think I copied it over and I just didn't want to miss anything. No, um, I, I think I, I think I added this. Um, uh, okay. Just, it's just a note that uh, I went to this event last year. They had it in Berlin and it's an open forum Europe event, but focused on more on research and on academics, but it's, they get an interesting mix of practitioners from industry, policymakers, and researchers with the idea of getting them all talking together and talking about uh, research around open source. So it was a really interesting event. So I would say that if it's something that you're interested in, they're doing it um, uh, at Harvard in Boston. So the CFP is open until August 7th. Um, and then the LF member summit, the CFP is open until August 30th. So those are just your friendly CFP reminders. I will, on the first one, I'll just point out if the submission is only a 400 word abstract. So it's not like a full academic paper that you yeah. have to put together. Yeah, well, you good can point. write a whole academic paper. I guess there's an invited part of that afterwards, I noticed. I didn't see that. Yeah, it? in the, it's in the in the call. It's like you do the abstract, you give your talk, but then some of the things could be invited to publish in a journal. Oh, uh, like some yeah. of the the some of the abstracts, yeah. Let's see, and then you would go through a whole journal process if you chose to, right? Like you don't need to if that's not your jam. I gotcha. Okay. 
Did they say the venue? I'm sorry. I'm just curious. They did. They did. It's it's in that link. It's like, but it's buried in the text. Okay. It's not like it jumps out at you. They say at Harvard and they're like, everybody knows where that one is. Hopefully. <laughs> they rely on that a lot over there. Yeah. Cool. So this is a call for an actual paper. Not like a call for... It's a call for an abstract. The four word abstract, anyone can do it and you don't have to submit a paper later. I maybe just confused things too much here now. I am confused. I'll read more about it. Four hundred words, uh, Gary, that's all you need to know. I need small words, man. Symposium I mean, so is even too long. So last year it was it was presentations. Some of those some of those presentations um, were presentations of papers. Some of them were not. So I think that I think they're open to a mix. Cool. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing, Don. And then uh, from via Anna, um, this is also from last week. This is another reminder that I don't want to lose. Uh, Anna is um, giving out the OSPO survey. Uh, if you are in an OSPO and you would like to participate, you would like to share this along, it would be much appreciated, uh, especially by this group who is partnered with the to-do group. This is the chaos OSPO group, um, the to-do OSPO idea is how OSPO came along. So you can find that link there, uh, share with your peers to take the survey to contribute um, insights about OSPOs. And that's everything we have. We did all the topics and all the reminders. Uh, before I say that's another amazing uh, Chaos OSPO metrics working group meeting, does anybody have anything else they'd like to uh, share, talk about with this group? Nope. All right. You're free. See you again in another couple of weeks. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.